Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Sarah from The Upcoming. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Um, and How are you? Are you, are you? are you in London? Yes, in London. <laughs> and, and, and where are you? Me, me, I'm Italy. In Italy, Rome. So you're in Rome. Okay, hello. I'm in Berlin. Um, maybe you could just kick off, I mean, obviously without giving yes. away plot details, et cetera, et cetera, but how would you introduce what Je suis Carl is, is all about? That's a bit mean to ask because I've, <laughs> you know, I've, been, I've been working on it for so many years and now to squeeze it into a very yeah. short segment is like the most terrible task for a director. Um, but I can try. Well, Je suis Carl is a thriller um, about the rise of a young, attractive fascist movement in Europe. And it's also about a young woman who gets trapped in their ideology. And um, it shows the fantasy of the far right wing of a day X, which is the day where they can take over power, literally. Um, it's a film, when we started working on it, that felt like a fiction, but in the last couple of years, every month, every half year, something terrible in Europe or in the world happened that made us realize how not fictional our story actually is. May I ask you something about your, um, your protagonist, Carl? He's very attractive, he's very seductive, Alfred Hitchcock used to say that in a thriller, in a film, when the, the villain, the bad guy, the, the, the bad girl are so attractive, it's better for the film. What do you think about? Well, I, I wouldn't, I mean, I think Hitchcock is right, um, but the reality of our research showed um, that fascists and um, the far right wing they are not, you know, they've changed their look, they've changed their corporate identity. Back 10 years ago, you know, we would speak about skinheads, about violent men um, who are maybe less intelligent, um, not seductive at all. But now um, it's a completely different story. If you, if you look at the youth organization of the Front National in France, the leading figure is a very handsome, mid-twenties man who studied somewhere in England, who speaks languages, and um, they've, there, there is a whole new mainstream culture with, you know, with cool music, with, you know, they look like hipsters, they, 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 they speak like hipsters, they, um, they've understood how to use social media, how to self-marketing to become part of the mainstream culture. So that's why we, you know, it's, we, we just found so many attractive leading figures within the youth movements all over the world. And that's why I found Janis Nieböhner as the perfect actor to, you know, to, to, to play a man, to represent a man. Um, but it's not something I made up. We, we found it in reality. And the thing is, you know, I, I'm sorry. Um, what I think what we have to do with those movements, with those ideas that are so radical, um, we have to take them seriously. Um, we just can't patronize them. We have to take them seriously. And that's why I gave them so much space. And that's why I let them be real characters and not only villains. Um, even though we don't know much about Carl, but I think that's what I wanted. And that's what Janis, the actor, tried to do is, even though he is a villain, we wanted to give him a soul and wanted to, 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 to show him as a man who was like a real person. Do you find it strange that, it, it's so true what you say, like I think the image people have of the alt-right, whether that's in the UK, whether that's elsewhere in Europe, whether it's in the US, is the kind of ultra-masculine, you know, skinhead, or, you know, maybe the incel crowd, you know, over in the US, this type of thing. And it's, we don't see this side um, represented in kind of in film, TV. So, you know, why do you think that is? And, and was that one of the big motivations for you to kind of it, show this in your film? Yes, that's the motivation because the other, um, 
you know, it's, it's more easy, it's simpler for us to see them as something that we don't are ourselves. But I think we have to ask, why can they be so successful? Why are they attractive? Um, I give you an example. Um, like a couple of weeks before we started shooting Just We Call, I gathered the youngsters of my crew, like the assistants, the interns, the drivers, so everybody who's under 30. And I, I, I read um, paragraphs from a, a far right wing youth um, movement um, from a manifesto from them. And it was scary because the way they put their radical ideas um, is so clever that the youngsters of my crew would say, we would, we would agree to most of that. Mm. Um, so that's how far it is already. And again, even though ultra masculine skinheads still exist, um, but you know, what I find difficult is when we want look at Trump, when we look at Boris Johnson, we make jokes about them, but we underestimate their power and their danger. I mean, five years ago, six years ago, the rest of the world would have not, have not believed that Trump would become president. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with Brexit. And what happened? Trump became president. Brexit happened. So we have those men, we have to take it all very seriously. Uh, political issues are very important, I think, for your uh, cinema. Uh, now you are doing also a Netflix film with uh, Jeremy Irons uh, called Munich. Uh, what do you think that uh, audience might be interested in these things today, in these issues today? I, I really do hope so, because... Um... I mean, Just We Carl is a political film, but I think it's also a film for an audience. And I think it's time for political cinema to come back and political cinema doesn't have to be dry and boring. Um, and I have a feeling, especially since the pandemic is everywhere, people are interested in films and programs that matter. Um, I mean, even though I've, I'm, I'm working for Netflix, I have a feeling not everything on Netflix is great. So the people have kind of watched everything that's on the platforms and that there is a new hunger for, for intense um, um, experiences with films and with, uh, with series. So I think it's a good time for a cinema that reflects the world we live in. And uh, so I, I'm, I have to say, I'm really happy that um, even though it's online and it's not a physical festival that just recall is selected for Berlinale because we can finally start talking about the film. And do you think that um, it makes a difference, you know, using fiction to kind of, you know, explore these ideas? Because actually when you think about it, a lot of political films are based on, on, on true life stories. So what can you do with fiction that perhaps you can't do if it's based on, on a true story? And, you know, in what way um, did you have to kind of research what is going on? I mean, you mentioned a few things there already, but you know, how, how deep did you go with that research? Did you actually do interviews with some of the people that might be similar to some of the characters you represent? Yeah, we did interviews. I have, um, because of the first film I did, where I did a lot of research within the scene, um, my face is quite known to, um, to most of the far right wing. So it's, it's getting more difficult for me to talk to them. Yeah. But um, what I do is I talk to many journalists who still investigate. Um, and of course, I spent a lot of, a lot of time, a lot of horrible hours watching their podcasts, watching their, their, their you know, because they're producing content all the time. Um, and you just have to take the time um, to take a look at it. Um, I'm reading their manifestos, their articles, their telegram channels. Um, so you get a very clear idea of what they want and who they are. Um, but I think to be fictional without, you know, without having a story based, uh, based on, a, on a true case, um, we can, we, yeah, I think you're right, we can go further. We can, um, we, we can go far, like what we do with Carl, who's, I mean, I don't wanna spoil, you know, I don't wanna, give away too much, but um, what he does at the end is quite a, seems quite like a fictional element that he not only 
um, throws a bomb, but also is, is willing to get killed himself for a bigger means. Um, so that seems like a fictional element, um, but I think it can raise a very, very strong discussion. Is this possible or not? And again, what we, what we learned throughout the last couple of years is we have to believe that a lot is possible. A lot of things we would not have guessed could happen actually happened. In your film, uh, it seems you said the uh, history repeating. Uh, we all are afraid of uh, this phrase all over the world, but uh, in Germany especially. In Germany especially, yes. I mean, again, I have a feeling that the whole world, most of the world believes that Germany is like still a very good place, a politically safe place. And I would agree, but still, realizing that in my country people who are people of color people who think differently um homosexuals are, f are facing fear are having fear again um like people who who have a different color don't feel safe anymore this is like such a threat to me um to understand that even my country you know where we where we believed even though we have a populist party, we can keep them down, but we can't anymore. I mean, they're not in power, but they might be. They might be, they, 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 they might be in charge in a couple of years in the federal, federal parliaments. And when they start um, working there, they will grow and grow. So um, I am, um, I'm scared. And I think in Germany, especially because it's, it was the same thing nobody in germany believed at the beginning that hitler would become so strong and powerful um, because he said very very openly what he was intending to do um, so we have now i mean we have a populist party and we have someone in that populist party who attracts many many people and i'm just you know i'm just really scared um, that him and some and some of the other very radical members of that party just get stronger and stronger. So yes, I mean, history repeats itself. I would not have guessed that racism can become something you can speak out quite openly in Germany again, but here we are. And in that sense, do you see your film almost as kind of a warning playing out, you know, just how seductive and easy it could be for the next generation to follow that, that same path? And, and in that sense, do you think also having all this young cast, uh, you know, that are attractive and, and seem likable in lots of ways, you know, you, you can kind of empathize with them other than, you know, the, the, extre the extremity of their views. So do you think also for a young audience, particularly, it can also almost serve as a warning? Absolute yes. That's why I made the film. Mm. That's, it, it is a film, you know, that's why, I, why there is this love story. That's why this is a young protagonist with Maxi, a girl, who gets trapped in, in you know, um, in those, I mean, she lost everything and she's like an easy victim, but she comes from the most liberal family you could imagine. Um, and it shows how hard it is nowadays to have like clear political and moral um, position in this, in this crazy world that gets crazier and crazier. Um, so absolute yes, it is a warning and it's a warning um, also for us parents to, you know, to don't lose the connection to the children and um, to this new generation, even though we probably don't understand social media as they do and we, but I think we have to keep talking to them and we have to keep talking about politics um, and um, just, um, yeah, just stay connected to them. Mm -hmm. I have to ask you something about your way of working because you, you have said that you're working for Netflix, but you have signed a lot of series TV, as for example, The Crown. Is you think that these platforms can help cinema today, or it will be something only for the audience? Well, that's a very tricky question um, because in a way the platforms are still very young. And of course, I think the algorithm 
is the enemy of cinema. Um, that's for sure. But I have to say, from my experience, the platforms are interested in talent. And um, I think, um, I think cinema will survive because, you know, I just, I just had an experience with my own film a couple of weeks ago. I was able to go and see it in a cinema just to, you know, to check the DCP. And I invited three people to come with me who haven't been in a cinema for months. And the experience was just incredible. And I have a strong feeling that in summer when the cinemas, the theaters will open again, there will be riots to get the tickets. Um, I'm very, very positive. So I'm very positive. If we keep going, making good films, cinema will survive. Cinema needs strong films. So, um, I mean, at the moment, the platforms, um, I have a feeling, but this is only me, they're quite open to explore and to, exp you know, to make experiments with all sorts of genres. Um, and in a way, I think, you know, we, 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 we can't turn time back. Streamers will always be there from now on. Um, so I think it's, 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 you know, it's on us to, to think, how can we make cinema? How can we make it better? And what film really is, is, is meant to be uh, shown on the big screen? And what is a film that probably only needs the, the small screen? I think it's really, it's not, it's not only about blaming the streamers for getting more and more powerful. It's also about us to, um, to think, yeah, what, what are the stories that need the big screen? And what does it mean to you to have your film showing as part of Berlin Film Festival? I guess having it first shown, you know, a German film festival with noting some of the things you mentioned. Um, but then also in the sense that, you know, it is virtual this year. Hopefully in June we'll have some physical screenings. What do you think that says about, you know, although it's a shame that initially it can't be shown in cinemas, are there actually some positives for smaller films, art house film? to be seen by a much wider audience than perhaps in the past, you know, film festivals can feel a bit closed and it's only for certain people to access those kind of films. Maybe it can become more mainstream through lots more online um, releases and greater accessibility to film festivals. Um, I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. I think um, from my perspective, um, I'm happy the film festival is happening now, um, even though the normal audience can't stream the films. Um, but I have a feeling the pandemic should not govern every aspect of our life. It already does, but still, but still to have the option to show to the press now, to, to, to start a conversation about cinema, um, is at least something because the alternative would be no festival at the moment, waiting for the pandemic to be um, to end. As you probably know, we are very slow with the uh, vaccination business in Germany, so we have no idea when this all will come come back to something that feels normal. So uh, I'm happy we have this week at the moment. I'm very hopeful the summer event will take place. Just we can will have a, a glamorous big um, open air premiere, and we can you know we can all celebrate cinema. Um, I think talking about Berlinale, I mean it's it's our festival here, and Berlinale was was huge. I mean I think on a normal Berlinale you have four hundred fifty to five hundred films, which I personally feel is maybe a bit too much. So mm -hmm. now it's condensed. It's more you know it's. It's, it's, it's reduced, it's still more than 100 films, but of course it's better for each film because the spotlight you get with each film is stronger, is bigger. Um, so, um, but I really, I think it's too early to discuss the future of film festivals, or at least for us filmmakers, because every filmmaker I spoke to in Germany who is represented at Berlinale this year is just so happy that we feel it's at least a start for us to come back. Um, and um, yeah, I hope, I hope the cinemas will open very soon 
in Europe so we can actually talk to the audience again. I don't know how much time we have, but I want to make uh, by myself a, a last question uh, about European cinema. You think today that we can talk about European cinema as they talk in America about the USA cinema? Well, I think there is, yeah, there is a European cinema, but it's very diverse. And I think um, German cinema is very different, obviously, to, to Romanian cinema. But I think there is, um, I mean, of course, the tradition of art house films, uh, also of radical um, uh, art house films, is much stronger in Europe than in the United States. Um, and I think that's, that's interesting. I mean, there are so many, so many countries on this continent, but um, uh, so many different voices and um, and still when I um, when you go to festivals I think there is a connection between European filmmakers and I think this will survive definitely I think there is a um, I mean I have to say my biggest frustration with the film festival now is that even I am a filmmaker I can't watch the other films so because I'm hungry for films and I you know I'm uh, um, I feel a bit like an angry child that my that I have to stay hungry. Um, so I don't know the last time when I saw a new Romanian movie or a new Italian movie. It's over a year ago, maybe one and a half years ago. So um, I feel like, um, I mean, I personally can say I love European cinema. And, uh, and again, I have a strong belief um, that cinema won't die, even though it will become more and more difficult. I don't know about your countries, but at the moment in Germany, we have to observe that the first cinemas are closing down, are shutting down because of COVID and they won't open again. Um, and uh, of course, this is, this is a nightmare, um, but I am sure if the cinemas open again this year, there will be, there will be a comeback of cinema also of, um, of art house cinema, of the more difficult films. Mm. I was also, sorry, go on. No, 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 for me it's okay. I said that. Okay, thank you. Um, I was just going to ask, you know, uh, in general, do you feel an optimism for the future? I mean, if you think of all that happened last year, um, you know, not least the pandemic, but the Black Lives Matter movement um, resurging, there's a sense of maybe growing activis activism amongst the younger generation. President Biden being elected in the US is a tide turning and perhaps you know the pandemic showing up some of these you know gross injustices that are happening you know the have and the have nots or do you not feel as optimistic as that and actually you know these forces are too seductive and and you know we're going in a negative direction you know as a filmmaker i will always try to represent hope and uh, and optimism um and I wish I, I could do that more because in the time of the pandemic, I have to say it made me very sad quite often because I saw, I mean, whatever you mentioned is positive, but I have to say, I'm afraid that after the pandemic, people will be more selfish than even before, um, just to, you know, to preserve um, their own wealth, their own health. Um, I, I wish I could be more positive. Um, at the moment, I, um, it's, it's difficult, but it's because, um, you know, we've been in lockdown for a year now. With, you know, we just had a couple of weeks where the country was opened um, in, in late summer. Um, the atmosphere in my country is getting so depressed, so dark. So I, um, I know I don't know. Let's talk about this in half a year, and maybe um, um, you know, maybe I can be a bit lighter. But at the moment, I wish, and I, you know, for myself, I'm I'm always hopeful. But when I look around, I see so much darkness, um, and I see. Um, in, in my country, the, the, the shift um, and the gap, the society gap is actually going bigger. And um, I'm, I'm not sure if we're strong enough to get back to some sort of solidarity very soon. But I hope, of course, of course, I hope. 
you have an idea where are your um, what life will have your film after Berlinale? Um, well, I think we will have a great premiere in summer, um, and we'll have a German release in September. And um, I have a strong feeling that in many countries um, there is an interest in the film because the political reality um, in many countries um, feels quite similar to what I show in the film. So I'm, I'm getting very, very good signals that the film will have a life in other countries too. I can't, I can't tell you more, but I get, I'm getting strong signals at the moment. And I wanted to just quickly go back to ask, um, you know, about your, your lead cast with, with Yanis and Luna. Like, these seem like such finds in terms of the actors at the centre of the film, and they really do carry the na narrative and, you know, kind of the charm that they have, you know, really serves the, the, your story well. So were they, how did you cast them and how did you work with them? Um, so I, I um, Janis has been around for many years. He started as a child actor in Germany and he's quite popular among young people. And I met him and um, I just, I was amazed because he's so charming. He's so, he's so modest. He's very, how do you say, grounded, like down to earth per kind of person. And, but you look at him and you just can't stop looking at him. And um, we, um, yeah, I think we, I did a casting only with him. And um, he said, well, Christian, Carl is a person who's so fluent with all the languages and who speaks so well, that's not me. And I said, I, I, I understand that's not you, but you will be able to become that. Um, let's work on that. And he was like, okay, he, I'm, I'm gonna be bold. I'm gonna, you know, he started learning English for the film, actually. His, oh, his English was, was, was not, I mean, he spoke English, but it was basic school English. He never spoke French before, so he did a lot of work. And Luna, that's to finish it, she didn't want to take the part. Um, I saw her in her first big feature, um, Blew My Mind, um, by the Swiss director, Lisa Brühlmann, and I was blown away by Luna. But when I, when I offered her the script um, to come to an audition, she was interested in other things. And she had just finished working on a very heavy film. And because Maxi's part is also very heavy with the trauma of losing a mother. So she felt like she, would, she has to do something lighter. So I did a big casting process, never found the perfect Maxi. And there was a coincidence that, that Luna came back into discussion and then she said, well, maybe she has done a mistake by not taking my offer. But then we did an audition half a year later, which was, you know, a great moment for me because I knew that it could be only played by her. Mm. And now we're all very happy that we found this wonderful couple. Mm. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank it was so lovely much. to speak to you. And thank, thank you for thank this you. really powerful, amazing. Thank, thank you. you.